Let's go. 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 let us go the head lice, but anyway, don't say anyway. <laughs> Come on, the bed bugs. Yeah. <laughs> head lice uh, is the new trillion. Yeah. Oh, jokes. Uh, so, uh, the reason why this was a very important panel to me because I said earlier these two people have actually impacted my life quite a bit. And the one thing I'm going to say about Gary is that what Gary taught me, and I'm going to, I don't even know if Gary remembers how we met, but I'm going to ask him. Uh, what, what Gary taught, what I realized when I watched Gary was that there's a lot of people, and I came from the agency side, a lot of people that can come in the room and go, here's how you should do your Instagram. And you go, oh my God, that sounds so smart. How many followers do you have? They go, oh, I don't have any followers. <laughs> but this is what I recommend. You ask Gary, he's like, a million, fuck you, now what? <laughs> Two million, uh, three million, <laughs> fuck well, you. Four million <laughs> from the <eye. laughs> But, uh, and so what it took away from me is, you, you, if you really want to understand, you have to be a true practitioner. Both of these men are practitioners. And so when I tell people text messaging is what I believe in right now, I didn't just say that. I wrote a book and put my phone number on the cover so I could learn. Gary told me, look, you're fucking around, you better have video. So I got a video guy to follow me around so I could learn what that was like. You know, and so at the end of the day, I think that that's the one thing that I've taken away from Gary, which is if you really believe that this is the thing, go practice it so you can learn that craft, so you can be the best at telling other people how to do it. Gary, how do we meet? I think we met at a Pepsi meeting. Nope. Fuck. Uh -oh. <laughs> mm. dun, dun, dun. You know where your first secret wine party was? Here. My suite in the Hilton. Not true. No? That was the second. Was it the second? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fuck. But you remember? <laughs> I, I, was that the first time we met? In the Hilton. You were walking through the Hilton. I hunted you down. And I was at Pepsi. And I thought to myself, I want to make Pepsi a digital leader. And Gary is a digital leader. I said, if I could partner with Gary, uh. people would believe that I was a digital leader too. So I could fake it until we made it. And so that's, that's how we met. I love it. I was Gary's first corporate client when he had 12 people. That's exactly right. But no question. Uh, I think Bond and a whole lot and PepsiCo, they took a shot at when we were super ragtag. Other faces and good friends I see took shots at, with us early on. And those are the meaningful moments, right? Like for all of us, no matter what we do, there's always gonna be a person that gives you an at-bat. So much of what brings me happiness is good things have happened to me, which allows me to, con I, I can give more at-bats today than I, sometimes I can give more at-bats in a month now than I used to be able to do in a year. Um, and that's just how it works, right? And I think that, um, especially when you give without expectation, that's been something I've been spending a lot of time with myself on, trying to figure out what makes me so happy and how do I articulate that as a framework. And I think uh, things that make me happy is like random music during a talk. <laughs> <laughs> Edison, New Jersey makes me the happiest, so you can make that play the whole time. But I think, I think, I think, no question, the thing that is really... He was joking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it was comedy. Yeah. Um, I think giving without expectation, right? Super big deal for some. We met, mm -hmm. he brought a bunch of youngsters on his team. I remember, like, remember like yesterday. And I'm, I'm, I'm just... I didn't remember when we met, like, yesterday. Well, we met, we're old we're now. We're old, it's a long time yeah, ago. we're old fucks. It was a little okay. more recent. <laughs> I, think, I think what really, what, what I think about, and I've already seen, like, six or seven faces. I can remember a lot of those meetings, and I know them. What, like, what, yeah. When you default into giving without any thought of what happens in return, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by the practicality of karma. Um, and I think that it's one of the hardest core business principles. And so, yeah, I, I think that's what you guys and some of the other people here did for me and I, I try to do for others. I had an interesting experience. By the way, this conversation for me is always, everybody can talk about marketing in the industry and we can talk about that, but for me it's really like what, what it takes to make the person that you are is more interesting to me. Maybe because I talk about the industry all the time, but what was interesting is I had an interesting moment recently in my life and this was like two weeks ago. I was in Michael's office and I said, hey look, I'm doing this or that. Should I ask for this? And he said, you know what? You are more of a statesman than that, dude. You are more of a statesman and you don't have to do that. And he kind of laid out to me and I was, and it's the same thing, which is, and that's always how I live my life, which is karma is much more important than, so what would you tell a younger you? Oh, what would I tell you? Well, one, start earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, believe in yourself and start earlier. And mm. part of that is we are now in an age of such extraordinary disruption where, you know, 
the iconic players of yesteryear. I mean, one of the things I think about a little bit is for about a 50 year period of time from 1940 to 1990, not much happened, right? It was madman for that entire period. Okay, we invented a Xerox machine, big fucking deal, right? But, Dude, you know how many pieces of my butt, I mean, copies of my butt that made? It's <laughs> nasty. <laughs> anyway, but the, um, but, but and, and now, uh, big companies, now after, you know, 30 years of incredible disruption, big companies have figured it out, which is, you know, instead of status quo being the status quo, change is now the status quo. They have, in the corporate suite, come to the belief that they've got to innovate. And if that wasn't true, then you wouldn't have had Unilever buying you know, dollar, shave. dollar Shave for a billion dollars. You wouldn't have had or Jet being now. bought by I'm three by three, but you know, by Walmart. So they're convinced now that, you know, um, stand still and you die. You've got to be like a shark. You've got to move forward. And they know they don't get it, which is amazing, which is an incredible concession. And Michael, to my, my, to, on that point, yeah. I think we're in the middle right now because I think they think they can acquire yeah, it, yeah. which is always what a banker thinks they can do. The problem is both the companies you mentioned have absolutely zero shot of success three years yeah. from today. They're already finished. Wow. Yeah. If you look at what's happening with, if you look at the current state of both those companies right this second, the soul is gone. The people that drove it are just waiting for their burnout yep. and they're gonna leave and the machine doesn't know how to take that organ in it. Mm -hmm. And so what's gonna be interesting to see is what happens next. Are we actually just at the end of those companies because distribution in the middle has been commoditized which was always their advantage, the mm -hmm. economics, or will they start understanding how to create Navy SEALs and Green Berets to go along with their Army Navies? And that's what he I'm watching. He talks about them as pirates, but I think yeah, it's, the, I think it's the exact, I, I think there's two things. So one is they're gonna become distressed assets, potentially, which will get bought by guys <laughs> like you, which we've talked about a lot, yeah. or guys like Amazon. Uh, the second piece is what they don't realize is that they're carrying legacy assets, which is talent. The sad thing is talent will be the largest determinant of success by 2025 than anything else, data, energy, it doesn't matter, but if you can't figure out how to retrain your talent to be of this generation, you're done. And that's what they haven't been able to do. That's why they don't succeed. What are you gonna tell an older you? What is an older you gonna think about what, what you've done in your life? What would I hope the 84 year old version of me is saying about me right now? Yeah. First of all, it's saying, I don't have a shot in hell of getting into heaven. <laughs> <laughs> no shot in hell? <laughs> it's because I think I'm trying to, like, the same way blockchain's doing what it's doing to the internet, I think I'm trying to do to heaven what, with my actions. Listen, I think that, um... <laughs> don't even get that joke. But yeah, blockchain. I get it. He said it. We're blockchain, we're getting that later. <laughs> I think I'll that, I think, I think, uh, I think Ethereum is super interesting. Um, I don't know, Bonnet, I, I would, I'd like to think that that version is, is proud of the way I'm conducting myself. You know, I, I, I have really big aspirations to be an all-time entrepreneur. I think that there are a lot of people who are gonna make a lot more money and make far more impactful businesses than me, but I think I'm up to something with how many entrepreneurs I'm impacting along the way. I know I'm giving up a lot of economics every year, which, you know, for that, purpose and I think that should play itself out nicely. It feels nice um, to live my life right now getting 20 to 50 DMs or emails a day of detailed 15 paragraph stories of how this one video or the consistent listening while they're running to the podcast. It's really, it feels nice. I got a couple of those <clears throat> off the back of my book and yeah, it's but. It's a high that you can't replicate. Yeah, you can't replicate it. It's funny to me. It's getting an email like that or going garage sailing and buying like a Thundercat for a dollar that I know is $11 on eBay. Both those, but I mean this, this is interesting. Both those things give me a bigger high than landing a $7 million client. They just do. And I think all of us have those versions. There's things that you know, excite you or make you feel good that aren't necessarily tied into the economics in the business world that you're in. And I think those are things that we have to pay attention to. In 1999, I read Harvard Business Review for the very first time. I read a quote in it. And I have every single print edition of the Harvard Business Review since 99. I read a quote that said, the mark of a great leader is where your number two goes to lead. And so I took that away, which is always make the people who work with you or around you better than you. And you know, I, I, think, I like to think, you know the people who've worked for me that I have a decent track record of doing that, but I have a really important question. If he buys the Jets, can we buy the Giants? Ah. Ooh, rival, yeah. <laughs> that would be preferable. <laughs> that would be good. This is like jet color. Almost. Yeah, I try to 
Makes them green at all times. Do you like get Mark Gassineau dolls? I love Mark fucking Gassineau. <laughs> Number 99, dude. So in, in kind of that vein, Michael, so yeah. your organization's expanding. I've watched this man's organization expand. Right, right. It can't just be about you. So how do you make sure that... And have enough kids. Yeah. <laughs> you got, like, That's amazing. Uh, I think you did. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, you got a lot. How many kids do you have, Michael? I got six. Michael's got six kids. I, 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 and they range from 32 to 20 months. So. Actually, before I, before, I, before I actually ask the question about culture and how you keep the culture in your organization, I do want to talk. So what's the, what's the legacy? Because you're a very, very personal guy, and I know you're. I'm going to ask you this too, yeah. but what's the legacy you do want to leave your kids? Or the right. message well, you want to leave? I, 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 so when I, I'm asked that question... Uh, well, not even legacy like asses, but message like... Sorry, you got it. You got this. Right, you'll tell me if you're unsatisfied with the answer. Okay. But it's, um, what, what, I, what I want to do is I want to prove Keats wrong, right? So Keats said, our names are writ on water, right? So like this, it's gone. Huh. I want to build, you know, legacy I want to have is going to be enduring. I want somebody like you want, right, to, you know, somebody to point to me and said, I learned something from that guy, or he built something great, or he changed something, he made things better. And, you know, and I want that to be remembered, you know, not just at my memorial service, but, you know, for a decade or a century after that. So that's awesome. what I want to do. Gary, I know you're very personal, I will not ask about family, but I just want to know, as a father, like, what do you want them to take away from your life? You know, I, I hope that they say, da, you know, dad felt so much guilt that grandma and grandpa put him in such a good position to succeed that he did the same for us out of a payback for them. My entire, you know. And they, and they let you live comfortably for the rest of your years. Right? Yeah, I mean, look, I, to, me, to me, I am, I am perfectly parented. I really believe that. Okay. Which is a very, I mean it, which is a very, you know, I'm driven by gratitude and guilt. I'm very aware that, that what they did was so all time that I feel a sense of giving back so much so that it's not just to my children. I'm trying to you know, use modern technology and communication to give back as a whole. I was really put on by really special parents and put me in a real position to succeed at the face of what was politically correct at the time. You know, I'm an immigrant who in the 80s and 90s, every Russian kid that came over during that time with my parents, education was the way out, right? We were all poor, we all lived in studios, education was the way out. And my mom created air cover for me to be an entrepreneur when the word didn't exist. And uh, I'm unbelievably grateful to, for that. And um, so I, I just want my kids to feel like I put them in a position to succeed. I don't want them to be entrepreneurs. I don't want them to be anything other than whatever makes them feel the way I feel about my game. I want to support that. And I think the greatest mistake in our society right now is that parents feel that children are a, uh, a, a product or an indicator of who they are, which allows them to manifest their insecurities on their children. I want to do the reverse of that and I want to put them in a position to succeed. Damn, dude, you're like a father, dude. I've known this man for a long time and that's some grown up shit, man, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was, okay, um, so, so to that, and then I'm gonna, I started asking Michael, but uh, Michael, we're gonna come back up and ask Gary. You had, I've met you, you had 12 people. How many do you have now? 850. 850, how many uh, offices? Uh, four. Four offices. So it can't just be about Gary, although your name's on the door. How do you make sure? It doesn't really fit on the door. Yeah, well, both of your names are on the door, by the way. But uh, but he's got his nice Chuck, signature. Chuck part out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. Um, what? Uh, how do you? How do you ensure that the people who come into that organization new understand what you were trying to build or are building? I think. Um, and is it hard? Uh, everything. Anything great is hard. Um, I think. Uh, I think there's two things that I think they, pu they, they pull from opposite directions. When you ask that question, the first thing that runs through my mind is moldable dictatorship, right? There's just four or five things that I believe in tremendously. So you definitely are Russian. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know I, I think it's super important to know what your three or four religions are, right? Empathy, you know, you know, 
it really matters to me. Attention really matters to me. The current state of culture really matters. And we have to create that way and we have to strategize that way. Um, but you know, if you bring up my 15 or 20 direct reports, a lot of them will talk. If Ryan Harwood, I bought Pure Wild last year, if he came up here, he was like, I didn't even talk to Gary the first six months. You know, I, I'm, I tend to be Lucky pretty, him. You know, I tend to be very hands off. Um, other than if people are, uh, to me the key things are, are you trying to succeed by tearing everybody else down versus yep. just building the biggest building? That to me is like something I really spend a lot of time on. Look, managers by nature don't have the luxury that the person that has the name on the door has, which is I'm the logo. I have no vested interest if my CFO is right or the entry level accountant's right. My, my, my vested interest is that the logo is right. So I'm able to be agnostic. For a manager, there's a lot of people who live their lives that when they hit $315,000 a year, that's a real mitzvah, like they made it. Like that's what they want. And what happens is they switch into defense. They were on offense their whole life until they got to the point where the work-life balance and the money and what other variables in their lives, it's set. Mm. And then they go on defense and what they're doing is they're suppressing anybody who wants to encroach on their territory, which naturally are the people that work for them. And I spend an ungodly amount of time paying attention to that dynamic. Everything else I feel comfortable with. At this point in my life, I now feel confident in my intuitive understanding of human behavior and how it impacts communication and products. So I'm gonna continue to bet on that skill and that will lead us in the right direction. Voice, AR, ML, whatever it may be. Text. You know, of course. Text. I told him about text, he was like, nah, it's not that big. Now he's like, text me. <laughs> Please. Um, good thing I record everything. We'll see. All right, let's um, go back. Go to the videotape. <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, I think that. Um, I, that's so. That's what I spend a lot of time thinking about: empowering them to no end, while making them accountable for two to four things that really matter at the end of the day. I spent a lot of time thinking about being inside of large organizations, and the problem is their pyramids, by nature, are built to create that situation. And what I always used to tell my team mm -hmm. is that, so even when I you know, almost poached to go work someplace else for Mondelez, I could have said, give me the person, when they asked what do I want to stay, I could have said, give me somebody else's role, but instead I said, let's increase the pyramid, give mm -hmm. me e-commerce, and then mm -hmm. we have, we put 100 new people mm -hmm. underneath the e-commerce mm -hmm. job. But that's very hard, because everybody mm -hmm. thinks that getting to the top means you have to step on the person mm -hmm. above. That's right. And so, culture, how do you maintain? Well, I, I as Gary was uh, talking, a a, a kind of an expression that I had or a philosophy that I had, uh, and I didn't invent it, but uh, I think it's very true, which apropos to exactly what you're saying, A people hire A people and B people hire C people. <laughs> and um, A people hire A people because A people says, oh my God, if I hire somebody better, they're just gonna create opportunities for me. I am totally secure in my skill. I can quit my job and get rehired anytime. But they feel fine about that. It only They know that it only makes them better. B people, it's all about preservation, the preservation that you talked about. And they have to hire C's because they gotta be smarter and better than the C's because that's how they assure their own preservation in the pyramid that you're talking about. I think that the new workplace um, and the workplace that you have, the workplace that I have, uh, are, are kind of different. People work in teams. It sounds like you're the type of manager that I also try to be, which is just walk around. You talk to anybody in your organization, you put up their feet, your, your feet on their desk, and you say, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. What are the three things going bump in the night? You know, and you know, it's, um, if you have a traditional organization, that just drives them nuts. It, what, what are you talking, you're talking to one of my people, why are you doing, you can talk to me about that. And it's like, yeah, I can, but I wanna get their point of view. So that has, um, follow me around, the A's and A's and B's and C's and always try to hire A's. The tragedy is, you know, at different times, and this was your point, an A becomes a B and that becomes very hard because when they reach that, you know, that whatever that number is and all of a sudden it becomes, it moves from advancement and expansion and generosity to preservation and when it does that, then it's really problematic and, and, and it just happens and it's sometimes kind of with tragic results, like I'm building a business, all of a sudden it becomes really big. I'd love to push that person up, but all of a sudden that A became a B. You know what's interesting about that is we've been spending a lot of time on, <clears throat> and I did this kind of anecdotal, 
It's fun to have some of the faces in this room. I always thought if somebody wasn't gonna be in my organization anymore, I appreciated them being in the organization so much that I wanna do anything I could to help them in the next chapter. Mm. We're taking it so extreme mm. that we're creating an internal job board because right now where I'm sitting in the world, so many people are asking me for help to, for their hiring. And I, when you were talking, I said, yeah. yeah one of the, I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around a little bit to my, how my brain works. The reason I was starting to tell you this is when he was talking, the thing that happens is, unless you're able to dr- grow the business at a rapid pace, yeah, the A's. You, 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 st- you have moments where you can't feed all the A's. And, and so like sometimes they tap out, but sometimes the company taps out and it can't feed everybody and that also creates the scenario. One of the things that's happening for me is because we've been marketing slightly different than a lot of people and that is now becoming a little bit more of the accepted practice, we have a lot of talent and, and a lot of C's are starting to th- think and are B's. A lot of B's are starting to think and are becoming A's and I can't feed all of them at the speed at which they're growing in comparison to how the overall company's growing. So, so that everybody wins, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about what would it mean if I take real talent and how do you get people comfortable to raise their hand and say, yeah, I do wanna be I the CMO of that startup or I do wanna go client side and work at Mondelez. It's scary, right? Because if they don't get the job, then they think they put themselves in a vulnerable position. I think the thing I spend a lot of time on is how do I eliminate cynicism within the organization um, and that's very, very difficult. I mean, people, when they leave Vayner, I try to meet with them and I just had somebody who left after four years, just got to that place and she said, literally the entire 15 minutes, she's like, I don't understand why I didn't come to you when you've done everything to create a scenario where you want me to come to you, my coworkers came to you. Like, I am not that kind of person. So, and I'm empathetic to that, I don't like to go to people either. So, it's just a constant battle. Mm-hmm. You're always battling at scale. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what, uh, that's what it's about. But we're lucky that we have expansive organizations, right? You went from 12 to yep. 280. Yep. Um, we're 850. I'm sorry, 850. I'm at 280. 850. Um, and uh, I guess I reverse it. Anyway, but uh, whatever it is, it's, it's the it's same shit. Very, very, very rapid expansion so you can. You know, you can, you can take your, you can feed. You can feed. And uh, if you can't feed, it's problematic. I wanna come back to. And don't let me forget this, finish yeah. that, but I wanna say one thing about raising capital versus making money around feeding, but go ahead. I don't wanna forget this way you'll Yeah, there's so many interesting topics we can talk about, including the whole venture thing, which is, yeah, right, exactly. You see that's, <laughs> well, I thought it was Michael Jordan next to me for a second. I anyway. actually think you guys have not spent enough time talking about. We just haven't spent enough and time. You have and how those. Because uh, I think he's got an interesting model. Right. Go ahead. What, what are you going to say? Because I don't. Well, okay. So what I was because you you talked about big companies and buying, right? Buying, and then once they bought, that transplanted tissue, right, gets rejected by the body, and that we have seen that sad story over and over, over and over and over again. Uh, and it's it's almost that the flip of that that it actually works and it's integrated as a rarity, but there is a reason, a long time reason why big companies don't experiment and try to buy the winners. And it's because, you know, the drumbeat of earnings releases every three months, if you're a public company, you cannot afford draining blood out of the system to make an investment in something new, particularly when, you know, it has a high failure rate. Venture will tell you, venture guys will tell you two in 10 are about the odds. The shareholders would go nuts. They would say, "What? You mean eighty percent failure rate? Why are you doing that? Right? And you can't just take a bunch of money out of earnings and put it into something. And then we get to the problem of you don't have anybody in your organization because it's been a pyramid for so long that really can take a risk and invent because there are more B's than A's, and they're really into preservation as opposed to invention, so they wouldn't take that risk to begin with. But the other bias of that is when you buy a company, when you buy a company, it is not, it, 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 is, it is not an impairment to your profits. It goes on your balance sheet as an asset. So there is a technical bias uh, to buy, not build. And so that is one of the reasons, I think, on a DNA level, institutional level, why big companies cannot invent, and it's more than just they don't have the talent, it's a structure. Um, Wall Street has created a scenario where these com- these are no longer companies, they're financial arbitrage machines. That's what yep. they are. And then they have jockeys that ride the horse as long as they can and then usually get thrown off. And well, make because, decisions on their self-interest right. on the way out. Because, you know, they used to call Time Inc., it used to be called, it was Time Life, the time of your life building 
And that is because, you know, you just work there long enough, you retire between 55 and 60, you're a millionaire, guaranteed millionaire, comfortable retirement. That's all that you had to do. So the name of the game was don't screw up. Right. You would say that, don't fuck up. Anyway, I don't would. screw up. Just don't, don't, you know, I didn't listen. I got fired. But anyway, just don't get fired. Worked and, out. Worked out, okay. <clears throat> but um, anyhow. Uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I um, but I, the other thing that's sad about it is that the scale of those organizations can actually change that dynamic from two and 10 to potentially six and 10. But yet there, there's not room for that because the leadership has never seen what the failures of those small businesses are to understand how large scale organizations can fix those. And one of it is just distribution and access. So like if we had, bought, I tried to buy the first receipt scanning platform and I said to the organization, it was a distressed asset, it was $12 million. I said, look, we're gonna make this a de facto standard. We're gonna put it on every single one of our packaging. And they said, yeah, but none of our competitors are gonna use this. I said, I don't care about our competitors. There's 1,200 categories in a grocery store. We represent 10 of them and those 10, all the rest of the categories though, but we're the only people who can get it to scale fast enough. But they couldn't see their way out of yeah. there. Now imagine if we had owned checkout, this was before before Checkout 51, before mm -hmm. all those. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we had owned that. Yeah. Or I tried to sell him Animal Crackers. But we had a $250 million movie deal. Animal right. Crackers is a $20 million business. $20 million business, we didn't care if it fell off the truck, but yet we could double it, triple it, and then we had a movie deal, and they were like, mm, we don't see the economics. I was like, oh my God, you're killing me, what do I have to do? Sorry, right, go ahead. Right. Well, no, but, but uh, this, this man is incredibly rare because he was a rebel inside of a very giant business, and he actually succeeded. Um, some days. Some days. I but, don't talk about the failures ever, just so you well, know. Well, but, but I mean, I mean but, but it was an incredible, I mean, you spent, in, I mean, imagine all the energy that you spent instead of fighting your own organization to like inventing, right? It was probably three quarters or maybe 90% fighting your own organization, your legal department saying, I can't do this. It's like, what? it's a word. What do you mean? It's, I mean, what are you talking about? Anyway, but it's. Um, I mean, that's, that's where you guys cross paths, right? You guys have similarities in that. Yeah, that's true. We started with big companies and try to try to reinvent them. There is a book, um, before I lose this thought, called Creative Destruction by a guy named Richard Foster, um, a McKinsey guy. It is supposed to be a manual, right, for big companies of how to reinvent, but when you read it, it becomes very clear that they're screwed. Forget it. It can't happen. It is example after example of how they are so lame when it comes to invention. And he gives many, many great illustrations of that. But you have to ask yourself the question, why, you know, when all of a sudden we went from oil lamps, used to be whale oil, right? That's what lit every city. And all of a sudden it became oil oil. But all the actors that were in whale oil, none of them went into oil oil. The wagons that won the West, the Canastota wagons, right? Why didn't that become Fisher Body and General Motors? They just didn't. And why, you know, right? Why now, you know, that it does take a Musk, right, to bring the brand new automobile when these big manufacturers are not leading, they're following. And it has to do to the fact that it becomes, you know, if you remember Shawshank Redemption that talks about being institutionalized, they all become institutionalized. Front to back, all the organization, every piece of capital and infrastructure and skill base is built for this machine and nobody elevates it to 35,000 feet to ask what business that we're in. So they're no longer, why did, they're no longer incentivized right, to do. But why did Amazon invent Amazon, right? You would think, right? Why didn't Kroger invent Amazon, right? Why or did, Barnes and Nobles? Why didn't <laughs> they're like, oh shoot, how'd that happen? So right, Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> Damn. Well, you know what? Actually, the first step is denial. Nobody's going to buy a book that way. I was they told look that at it when, first. When right. I took econ, they said, "Are anybody ever going to really buy an Oreo online?" I was like, "Oh my god, please." Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, so, we took it sixty-five to two sixty-five. So literally five years before Google, okay. Time Inc. invented the first Google, and it was called Pathfinder, right? Except the mistake was that the only fact you could find out was contained in Time Inc. titles. And the thinking was, well, shit, if it's not in a Time Inc. title, it's not, you know, who, who want to know anything outside? So it's, it's not fake news. Of, so it failed miserably, right? But the, the idea is that the people in this room are the people who are going to realize the future. If you look at this country 
and we're all here because we love this country. If you look at this country, and you look at some of the great, great, great companies, they, you know, the Facebooks, the Amazons, you know, they're from here, right? And it's because we are, you know, very adaptable and we're all capable of this reinvention, creative thinking, and um, I guess I'll, I'll end. No, um, no, no, we're not ending. <laughs> Did you want well, to my piece, just by saying, that um, you know, being an entrepreneur is the hardest, bravest thing that anybody can do, and you've got to be. You can't do it well unless you are all in, all in. Or, or, <laughs> or you're all out. No, I mean, it, or, <laughs> or you're capable of dealing with other people's opinions. The reason people struggle is because when you're an entrepreneur, it's really fun to work somewhere, right? When you work somewhere, when something goes wrong, including if you get fired. You blame your boss. My boss fucked me, right? Like, 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 like entrepreneurship's difficult because there's no wiggle room out. You fucked up. Like everything that's wrong in my company is 100% my fault. Like every, and there's hundreds of issues right now. I hired the head of that department. I created that process. Like everything runs through me and I think people struggle with entrepreneurship more because they're worried about the judgment and you've gotta be able to be numb to that feedback and that is not most people's makeup. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I'm learning that, to be honest and, with and, you. And Bonnie, I think the thing that's happening, one thing that everybody here has to understand is like, look, we've lived through eight or nine years now of economic prosperity. There's a fuckload of people running around this town right now that think they're special. They've never made money any month they've run their company. They've lost money every month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like people cheer raising capital. You gave up a piece right. of your business. So, so Gary, I'm gonna ask you a question. Sure. So there was um, something like 160 plus or minus unicorns minted last year. All right, well, hold it. Okay. How many of those, right, how many of those will be around three years, five years, and how many of those founders, right? One billion dollars is the valuation of those company. How many of those founders, right, are gonna walk away with a meaningful amount of money? Uh, probably 10 to 20% will be around and do their thing, and 80 to 90% of the founders will leave with meaningful money. With meaningful well, money? Of, oh, yeah. of those 10 or 20. Yeah, because once yeah. they of get, the, No, right. no, but of those 10 or 20. But here's the important, but here's my point. One more time, Every, I wanna make sure we're okay. agreeing, because yeah. I think 90% of, of the, the 160 right now are gonna leave with meaningful money. Really, I don't yeah. think so. Well, first of all, it might just be we have a different, different definition of meaningful money. <laughs> <laughs> No, it might, it might, it might. I, I, no really, it might. I mean, I mean that. Meaning, I think somebody who runs a company and is extremely good at raising capital for a company that eventually goes belly up, but she or he is able in series C and D to take home 10 to $30 million and take it home is meaningful money for something that ended up being a house of cards. Okay. Your, my definition and yours are different. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but the reason why I anchor that as you know, 10 to 30 is one to 3% of the whole shooting match, right? I mean, these are companies worth a billion plus, but we do agree on this, which is most of them will just go poof, right? So think about that. They have been exalted by the press, right? 160 unicorns, right? Unicorns. And they're gonna, you know, billion dollar plus. And the bulk of them are house of cards. The bulk of them have never made money. The bulk of them are really a product of financial engineering and good salesmanship. Uh, and by the way, a financial communi community that has more money than it has either brains or deal flow. And there's it's a certain too, urgency. There's too much money in the yeah. system. Guys, the yeah, how do you feel about venture, Gary? First of all, can I just tell you, me yeah. and Gary, this is this will be the fifth year that we've done this. Everybody who I put between us gets chewed up. And this oh is the god. most docile I've ever. I'm like, oh my god, it's working. Uh, so I brought the big gun. I was like, ah, put Michael right in front. Uh, I, but uh, I'm how do you feel about, my own. Yeah. I, I think. How do you feel about venture? Look, the the biggest financial loss in my career, personally, mm. was. 15 months ago or so when I decided to not close out the fund that I was raising and give back everybody's capital, yet I was carrying the talent and anticipating the 2% management fee on a $150 million fund and took a complete bloodbath. And, and I do think $10 million is meaningful money. And so like, and so like I'm not I'm in cool the business, I'm not in the business. <laughs> I'm not in a, you know, I came from zero. So when you come from zero, losing seven figures out of being noble feels really fucked up. 
And so it's the most proud I've ever been in my life. And it happened because as I was raising this fund, yep. I just woke up one morning and said, holy shit, I don't believe in this game right now. And so what am I gonna do? Lose, because I, you know, it's funny. Losing that money was really smart because I knew, I know myself, which is if I ran that fund and that money got lost, and it would have because if you don't believe in something completely, you're now guessing. The reason I've been good, I don't predict. You know, like people are like, he predicted shit. I don't predict anything. I fucking execute early and then I communicate about it. And so I don't guess. And so like for me, when I don't guess, I'm investing in Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr like I did early on, and when I'm guessing, I looked more like the investor I was in the back half, and I just knew that shit is fucked up. I'm very down on it right now. I have not invested meaningfully now for two years. I'm really struggling with it. I will get back in the game because I genuinely believe in voice, and I will absolutely bet on apps built on top of Google Home and Amazon and Alexa. So I'm excited. It's the first time I'm yeah. kind of feeling like I'll get back in the game yeah. because I've seen this rodeo before, yeah. right? Because these are apps on top of a device that will matter. You know, Spotify and, and, and Waze and Instagram, uh, these are apps on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited about that, but how do I feel? I feel very negative about it. I think there's a bunch of B and C and D and E, F players who think they're entrepreneurs and all-time entrepreneurs because it's cool. We put it on a pedestal. I think people raising a bunch of capital and burning cash have no idea what the fuck they're doing, aren't building actual businesses, are building on top of platforms that have all the leverage, they have none. Yeah, exactly. and, it's a, and I'm just yeah. not into it and I can't wait for shit to hit the fan and carnage and blood because, <laughs> and I mean it, and I mean it. Here's why? Because in the game of business, merit should prevail. Like you shouldn't win if you suck. <laughs> so, and, and so everybody who's rolling around I'm with a screwed. And so everybody who's rolling around with a T-shirt of their startup and think they're special and are and are really pumped about like you know like I raised like guys listen to the conversations. Yeah, I know. Every conversations yeah. I raised. I raised this, I raised that. I raised I, children. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? But, but it's interesting because, so, so, je, so, so you know, Michael to, came from zero, got fired, had the paycheck in his pocket, and built this business brick by brick, mm -hmm. but what were the things that kept you up in the night when trying to build a real business versus, so the biggest thing wow. you hear in the venture conversations is the most amount of time, and you talk about this too, that a founder will spend is raising money versus building a business. And you say that to me all the time. Yep. And the reason why he built the incubator he has today is because he doesn't want the founder to spend time raising money. He doesn't think that that's yep. important. Money's easy. Businesses are what's hard. And so just talk mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. I feel like that ethos so, was built. First of all, one thing, I think one earmark of an entrepreneur is the fact that you, no, no, that you grew up really hungry, and I think 100%. all three of us, all three of us did that. I grew um, up real fucking hungry. I'm not gonna lie. Go ahead. I know. But Still starving. Making, Let's get this making, going. You're making up for it. So the um, you got time, Bonnie. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> you just said we were old earlier. Uh, you know the fact that you got a lot of fucking time. The fact, uh, the, uh, but there's so many things we can talk about. But the um, I think one of the more important things about being an entrepreneur is having a North Star because if you are in the weeds, right? You know, Rich said that to me the other day too, Rich Dennis. Oh, so, no, yeah, it was interesting yeah. to hear you okay. go. Keep so, if you don't know your finish line, you have right. no idea how to that's fucking right. navigate. And because in the day to day, right, in the battlefield day to day, you know, all sorts of ugly things happen. And if you don't have a 35,000 feet view, you will, you know, your compass will, you'll just be lost. Because if you, if you soak up every day, you're going to have some victories and, oh, my God, you're going to have three defeats in a row. And do, you love, you do you love micro defeats? Do I love micro I, You know what I love? I love being what Edison said, right? You remember it. No, you don't. Okay, Edison said. You're only old enough to remember Edison. Me too. We're, not, we're pals, by the way. <laughs> we hung out. New Jersey was good. So, um, and, but, he, but what he said was, I never failed, I learned 10,000 ways how not to make a light bulb. And that's what I think exactly what you're getting at, micro defeats. Yes, you've got to, they're not defeats, they're learning opportunities. And we talk all the time about quality at bats, right? You can strike out, but a quality, what I demand is a quality at bat, right? I think, Michael, I think the problem there is too many people in this room and in this game are looking for the short-term economics. 
Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, you know, back to you have time. I think the reason people struggle with micro defeat is because they're looking to do it so okay. fast. The amount right. of 20 year olds who think by 30 they have oh, to yeah. have their multi million dollar thing, it, you know, you just see it in people's behaviors. You take shortcuts, and then when you're taking shortcuts, you make fatal flaws, not short term flaws. And that yeah. is, by the way, one of the things, you know, we have an internship program, and everybody there wants to be, you know, an entrepreneur, and we, we kind of say, okay. Let's level set. Number one, this is not college, right? When you're in college, you're a customer. You're not a customer, okay? Everybody here has their hair on fire, and the answer to whatever they want, if they say, get me coffee, the answer is yes. Don't say, wait a minute, I didn't spend $70,000 a year to go to Yale, right, to get somebody else. I mean, fuck you, right? I mean, you know, we need coffee right now. Why? Because we're gonna, Yale, be, we're gonna be working for the next 23 hours straight. So. The, so number one, you're not a customer anymore, right? And number two, they do have this visual that they come up with an idea on Monday. On Tuesday, they raise capital. On Wednesday, the, you know, they got the MVP. On Thursday, somebody buys it for a, biz, for a billion. And on Friday, they're in San Tropez. And you just gotta disabuse them of that and because that's just not how it works. It's it's a lot of hard work. It's, you know, front to back. It takes time. It, yeah, it takes time. So you can't get, I, we can't go to San Tropez? We gave up center pay. Uh, so wait, it's interesting because Rich Dennis, who Sundial, I was his chief growth officer for a year. They just sold to Unilever a little under a billion. Everybody's like, oh my God, Rich, da da da. Oh, it's amazing. I can't believe yeah. what you've done, da da da. And when you talk, it was 26 years. The man started selling soap on the corner. First of all, he escaped two revolutions. They had to get his family out as refugees. He learned how to make African, soap for, for Af Africa. from in Africa. Right. Not revolutions here. Yeah. Uh, he learned how to make That's soap next. from his, yeah. yeah. They lived 12 people in a three bedroom apartment, learned how to make soap from his grandmother who used to sell in a village and started selling bars of soap on the corner in Harlem, dude. Like, and, and then to cut to have a $300 million largest natural beauty business and then to sell it. I mean, you're just like that. But Gary, I've watched you. I, I, I've watched you for two years, but uh, I watched you do, and that's what people don't understand. Uh, Gary came to me, 12 mm -hmm. people, 30, 60, and he was like, okay, what's the, what, is, what do big agencies look like? And we had a heart to heart, and I was like, well, here's what I know of da 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 da. And it was interesting to watch every single move that Gary wins, losses, re architecting, shifting. And Gary still gets, I put the beauty business in his business, and when I saw some of the things I didn't like about it, he still gets an earful for me on like, this is, and Marcus gets a, Earful for me all day long because right. I know I could get him on the phone. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, I, I think that people underestimate Pe how long it, look, how long it takes. We're going to take two questions so people get ready, yeah. and then we're going to show it. Let, let me just say this: I think I think advice is interesting. I think I think it always matters more when the person that's giving it to you actually lived it. You know, the thing that I get razzed for the most on the internet happens to be the thing I'm single most proud of, which is. I entered my family business, right? And so like a lot of people, when I put out content, will say, well, why do you listen to him? Like his family put him on. I went into my family business, yeah, which was a wasn't. three million, but, yeah. but, but it's even better. And I've never, I'm, do you know, I'm not even sure if you know this, it's, I've only started talking about it for the last six months and you've been too busy for me. So <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me say this. It's easy for me to give advice to people to be patient because my true life story was at 22 years old, I went into my family business. I took my family business from a three to a $60 million business. I owned 0% of that business. I never got paid over $100,000 because it was a family, immigrant, uh. old school business. And when I left at 34 and started VaynerMedia, the reason we were so humble and started in Buddy Media's fucking conference room, you would think somebody who built a $60 million business, I left that business at 34 years old had no money and no equity to my name because the business was completely owned by my dad because I'm part of an immigrant family business and you go in and you build it for your family and a lot of them end up, the dad leaves and you take it. I had a different path. So here I am at 34 for all you 20 year olds, zero to my name, right? Never got paid 100,000 a year and had the chip on my shoulder that I actually built something from three to 60, me, I built it, and left with nothing. That's, so you know, like, I, I, so you I started. You you loved your parents. Though. I love them. Okay. I, like, I, like, on it, but it's so still, you know, on that no, but Michael, it's important. Like, that's the yeah. best thing I ever did. Yeah. I paid them back for all the amazing things they did. I, that feels real whole for me. But, but, you know, like, people are just so impatient. I'd only started it then. 
and I had a grind then, and I had a scratch then, and so, and I've done a whole lot in eight years because I learned a lot in those years that I was running. You could do a lot, of, listen, a lot more of your stuff, you know, stuff happens later in people, when did you start really getting, like. Late 30s, man. Yeah. It's not tomorrow, yeah. and it's the late 30s on the experience of 20 years, or 15, 18 years of good execution, right? And then you could start saying obnoxious shit like $10 million isn't meaningful money. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, we, two questions. I'm, I'm getting to shut it down. Carlos, go ahead. Gary, speak about value and mentorship. You know, look, you mean from the perspective of being a mentor or having one? Talk, having one. You talk a lot about A, B, and C players. What's it going to take for someone to go from B, D, C, up to A, B? Look, I think everybody does it different, right? Like, I, I will tell you flat out, I've never had a mentor, not even my dad, right? Like, I'm an inside guy. I'm in my own shit, but I don't think that's cool. I don't think it's any, I think it's a flaw, if you want to be frank. Every time I've been open to hear shit, I'm like, oh, that helped me. And like, like, it's just not my natural being. I think the value of mentorship actually has much more, Carlos, to do with the individual, right? Like, I've watched you from afar for a while, and you pick up things from other people, and you've got, like, everybody's different. I think the key is self-awareness. The key here is self-awareness. Who the fuck are you, and how do you learn? I knew how I wanted to buy the New York Jets. It was by buying nostalgic brands and flipping them. I knew that I had to eat shit for 10 to 20 years of running an agency to learn all this shit. Now I know what to do, but 10 years ago my thesis was right. I could have gotten the capital, I could have done it, but I didn't know. I needed, the way I learn is by bleeding. We talked about right? trying to get you to buy mug root beer. That's, how, that's right, that's how I learn. I need to taste. So. I don't need a mentor because somebody telling me something is why I got D's and F's. I need to just go in and taste. Other people really get value out of mentors. I watch people, I give them one piece of advice, I'm like, how the fuck did they run with that shit and do all, you know? You know? So I think, I think self-aware, if I could give everybody here, besides health, besides health, it's self-awareness. Because once you have that unlock and you stop bullshitting yourself of what you want to be versus who you actually are, shit starts changing. Yeah, okay. Another, go ahead. Uh, just shout it out. Uh, yeah. What's the worst advice you've given? Michael. <laughs> quit! That was Fine, the worst Quit your job. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah. uh, I can answer it while you're thinking about it. I think the worst I'm advice. I'm slower in the I think the worst. I think the worst advice I give is when I make it through the eyes and ears and filter of who I am as a person. I think too, way too many people give advice predicated on themselves. A lot of the things I look for are themes, and, but I spend a lot more time looking at the collective than myself because there's a lot of nuances about me that doesn't map for other people. So I think way too many people's advice is too singular and they, and they don't have empathy to understand the subtleties of everybody else around them. I think it's interesting Gary said that he's in himself. I ran into Gary in Turks and Caicos in a random wow. situation, yes. random situation, and Gary had just stacks of books. He was like, phone is off, it's me, family, and like this introspective moment to read. You were reading Steve Jobs yep. at, at that book. time. It was really, really interesting insight. That was a very personal person, but I don't think people know because he's so outward. Uh, Worst Diantra. advice you ever gave. So I'm, I'm going to uh, restate the question a little bit. When do I give the worst advice? And when I give the worst advice is when I'm trying to be nice, right? <laughs> when I'm trying to be polite. Which comes super not natural to you. It's true. <laughs> it's true. But, you know, but, but basically the worst advice is when you, when you read the, you know, the other, you know, the person on the other side. And you tell them what they want to hear, yeah, that's as opposed right. to the truth. Right. The truth is tough, and um, sometimes you just feel like you got to do that. But that's yes, really it's um, uh, when you when you tell them what they want to hear and, and not what is real. You know, I'm being told to stop. To but I'm going like to I'm going to take two more questions because this feels to me like one of the most truthful panels that you're going to see at South by Southwest, and I'm very excited about it personally. So, two more questions. I know, brother. <laughs> two more, two more. Shut your fucking two mouth, D-Rock. Yeah. <laughs> D-Rock. Two more questions or that's it? We're going to shut it down. If not, You're all right. Uh, Thank you, brother. <laughs> Thank you. In the back, just yell. How do you guys uh, reconcile sort of work-life balance? I mean, obviously being extremely busy, but you spoke a lot about family and that sort of thing. Big conversation about that. From my standpoint, I think it's insane to pander to the current state of political correctness around parenting because it evolves every 10 to 15 years based on our overreaction one way or the other. I think we beat ourselves up too much. I handle it super well. 
I know what my intent is. I fucking love my children, but I can't love anybody if I don't love my life. And so I'm willing to be selfish to be selfless. I'm also the byproduct. It's very individual. I'm not gonna, I could never think to give somebody advice on raising their kids or running their family. No, but none of us know what's going on in somebody else's fucking home. You don't know how well it's working for me. You don't know how my wife and I were brought up, why that works for us because we're used to it and it's our conditioning. You don't know that. So cool, you wanna tell me, like, cause you feel good about yourself coming home at five, but meanwhile you're on your phone the whole time? Like, the judgment of other people's parenting is asinine. I handle it super fucking easy. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. All right, I'm, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we should ask Katie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, work-life balance, I, I think number one, um, you, you gotta love what you do. Right. So if you love what you do, if that's if you love what you do, it all kind of blends together. Uh, For one thing, you're, you know, um, comfortable within yourself. You're a satisfied person. That's, by the way, what makes you a great parent is not coming home and being a son of a bitch because you're pissed off of what you did for the last, you know, 12 hours. So I think that uh, if you love what you do, then, you know, you're kind of a satisfied, content person. And that just. Works you itself know, out. It works itself out. Go, just real quick. What do you want to put on your tombstone? He gave more than he took. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I actually, it's so interesting you say that. You're just an interesting guy, man. We Thanks, should man. hang out more often. But, the, um, but you can't speak first because, anyway. But, <laughs> it's my default. But, the, um, uh, but uh, one time uh, I felt that in one of our exits, somebody benefited more than I thought they deserved. And my partner brought me back and said, you know what, if your tombstone reads, here lies Michael Loeb, he gave too many people too much, You've what won. about that? And I said, you know what, I can live with that. That totally works. All right, block or not? Blockchain, I'm extremely bullish. I think that it's an obvious technology, but I think there's a bunch of fucking losers in it right now and it's early as shit. So it reminds me very early internet. There's a bunch of club promoters and hucksters and real estate agents and social media experts. And, but, but that's exactly what happens when new yeah. shit happens. When I was in, a, I, yesterday I was in, I was like, this is exactly like the early internet. Wait a second, I've seen this. And, th- and that's what fucks with smart people. They see the people associated with them and they're not smart. They think that is what represents it and that's why they underestimate it. But the technology is black and white. It is a meaningful technology. Is it luck? Oh, go ahead, you wanna? So, so basically, um, you're, blockchain, you're talking about the offensive line for the Jets, right? <laughs> I'll tell you that. Uh, no, it's going to be go. very, very important. Luck, is it about luck or not? Oh, part of it is, for sure. Uh, but they say that, what's the expression? That, um, uh, not that you make your own luck, but that... Uh, Preparation, you know, that Yeah, thing? yeah, that's right. What, what is it? You're younger than me. Preparation meets opportunity. Yeah, that's right. It's luck. Yeah, I mean, Peter Goober said to me, miracles happen to everybody. You just need to be prepared to accept it. Yeah, I think, I think luck is an interesting one for me. I have a little bit of a different take. I'm curious in the context that it comes out of somebody's mouth. So I believe in chance and all these many things and luck, what have you. But I think that most of the time when somebody spits that word, it's because they're not in a happy place with themselves and they're trying to justify why somebody else got something. We very, uh, we very okay. much struggle with, with uh, responsibility and mm-hmm. taking on responsibility and we like to pass it on to somebody else and we're trying to justify why we're not winning uh, and we like to throw that, that word's being thrown around by a bunch of fucking losers to try to make themselves feel better. Right. When, when I, I, I misunderstood you in the beginning, when I think you and I would both describe ourselves as lucky. Sure. Right? And, but when you assign that to somebody else, like he was successful because he got lucky, that is what losers Ju- do say, ju- right? Judgment's, ref, judgment's right. a real mistake. It's a real mistake and we're all doing it at scale right now and it, mm-hmm. it's really a mistake. You're just, you're deploying it. Like I think, you know, it's back to that mentor question. I really am trying to figure out how, peop- how to allow people to start really thinking just as much as possible inside their own frame because envy and judgment, it's just bring, like putting any energy, like I only want all of you to win. There's so much abundance but of victory. he wants a couple of points of each. No, I, I want zero. I, I, what, I, what I actually want is to figure out if I'm better than you on merit. Like, I want all of you to win. I want to win more than all of you. I genuinely think I will. I mean it, I mean it. But, but, it if, I do, but, I, but if I don't, but if I don't, I'm pumped. Right. I'm like, you fucking earned it, you won. All right, last words. Last words. 
Uh, oh my God, that sounds so. <laughs> last piece of advice. Uh, last piece of advice. Last piece of advice is uh, I, I've never seen a period of such wrenching change. Um, me and El me and Edison used to talk about this, by the way. Anyway, but <laughs> such wrenching change, uh, and uh, you guys, everybody in this room, you're going to herald that change. It requires a great deal of conviction and courage. You've got to again have a north star to guide you. In other words, the speed bumps of every day can be a little deflating, but you can't let that damage your spirit. Uh, surround yourself with great people. We talked a little bit about advice. The interesting thing about advice, don't listen to any one voice, gather a lot, and then kind of tease out for that the really interesting opinions. And um, But do, uh, it does take a village. Uh, be generous, pay it forward all the time, and create that community. And the only one way to do that you know, look, if you're an asshole, you're not going to be able to do that. Everybody's going to figure that out. you got to be a good and generous person and create that network that is going to be supportive of you, good times and bad. Your turn. I think, that, I, I, think the, uh, I think the biggest thing I would leave with is something I've been spending a lot of time on is just stop judging yourself. Everybody else is doing it for you already. <laughs> I mean it, like, you need to get past that part. If you're not in that right place, you got no fucking shot. You can listen to advice all fucking day. You know, you've got to stop judging yourself. Everybody else sucks at shit too. <laughs> <laughs> and not to attenuate this, but I'll, I'll share one other thing, one other thing, and it has a lot to do with what you're saying, but I'll say it better. Anyway, but um, Much more no long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mr. 10 million. But anyway, the, um, but, what, what uh, detachment's an important word, and there's a mm. thinking in poker that if it's your life savings in the middle of the table, you're done, right? You're just done. It's got to be bits of plastic, right? And if you don't have that deta detachment, then you're you're just you're just you're just done. You're just it, it, done. It's, it's a really interesting point. Like it's funny to Thank me. Thank you I, for that. No, it is. It is a super. I, I will say this. It's a super interesting point. It's unbelievable how unemotional I am about business. For all my energy and everything that you think about, like it's, I'm completely numb to it all. Like, if somebody screws me or this and that or I lose, or like, it's just, I think the detachment is such a variable into why it works for me. It's just, I don't feel it that way. I think it's, it's the cost of entry to play this game. And that's why I think there's so many fake entrepreneurs right now and why I'm nervous. An entrepreneur likes getting punched in the mouth. And that's a very different mindset. Yeah, and just because I've got to get the last word, but. <laughs> well, technically no, I'm, I'm going to get the last but, word. But um, you, you know, you're right, a lot of people, revenge, right? Lose the revenge thing, people are gonna screw you, and you know what, you just gotta move on. And you just, uh, because it just, uh, wasted emotion and energy, it's gonna happen, right? You know, guys are just gonna, they're just gonna fuck you, they just will. So go well look, so we have BreadBot in the back, which is an automated yeah. autonomous bread bakery. Let's give a huge round of applause. I don't get a buy? Yeah, of course. Love you. Uh, thank you. Take All right, sir, Thank you, but definitely go see our, our, uh, our entrepreneurs who have brought BreadBot here for- We got a mutual awesome. friend, Casey Adams, right? The best, good dude. See you guys, take care everyone. See you, Carlos.